Okay, here we go. Good evening and uh, welcome to the 168th meeting of monthly meeting of Fossil Hyderabad. Um, we are delighted to have each one of you, and I'd like to specially recognize the presence of Mr. Newly christened Mr. Bhagat Singh. His real name is Dinesh Bajaj, and uh, he is from our mother chapter in Cupertino, California. He's traveling to India on some personal work, and uh, very nice of him to log in from Mumbai. Welcome, Dinesh Ji. And of course, um, a warm welcome on behalf of the president to each one of you, and especially Dr. Ayer. As always, it's very inspiring to have you in the meeting. Before we kick off this meeting, as usual, as is the usual practice of every Fossil chapter, we'll start it with a prayer. And may I request Mrs. Indira Narayan to read the prayer, please. Thank you. Prayer, where the mind is without fear by Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arm towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you, Indra Garu. Thank you, especially for taking this on at my request this morning. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. This meeting, as is every meeting of Oswell, Hyderabad, and as well as many chapters, is an endowment lecture in the name of the dear one of one of our members or supporters or patrons. And this month's lecture is the annual endowment lecture in the in memory of Sri Pokala Nagendra Rao. He is the father of uh, Rao Pokala. Uh, both Dinesh Ji and I have been trying to get in touch with the family, but unfortunately we could not connect. So I'll give a brief a profile. I'll read his, uh, a very brief profile of Sri Pokala Nagendra Rao. He was a... Uh, very interesting career. He first did his BA in mathematics and graduated in 1946, just a year before our independence. And then when he then he went on to do his mechanical engineering from Annamalai University in Chidambaram in Tamil Nadu. They belong to Nellore. So Chennai is the city. And at that time, Chennai and Andhra Pradesh were together. It was just called the Madras Presidency. And after his mechanical engineering, where he graduated in 1950, he worked in various irrigation projects on the various crest gates, the pumps, and all the mechanical side, the Kakinada port, Nagarjun Sagar. And people from this part of the country would be able to easily relate to these names. They are the heart and soul of this part, these states, because they provide the much needed irrigation facility, the Krishna and Godavari rivers. And, um, you know, he was involved in the Krishna barrage construction over the river Krishna. And then um, he headed the workshops and missionary division for uh, the irrigation department, both at Nagajan Sagar, uh, at Macharla and Karampudi. And then he also was involved in the Krishna Godavari Delta drainage improvement project at Eluru. And he was uh, a part of the team of that famous Sir Arthur Cotton Barrage across the river Godavari at Davaleshwaram. And when the Kakinada port was um, not built but improved, he was the port engineer to improve that. And he retired in the year 1984 as a superintendent engineer and in the same year he passed away unfortunately and his son Prakash Rao Pokala uh, is married to Mr. M. L. Swami's daughter Srimati Sucharita 
both of whom live in Cupertino, California, and they have set up this endowment in his name. So we are uh, very happy to have this 10th annual endowment lecture in his memory. And uh, at least Mr. Dinesh Bajaj from Poswell Cupertino is here with us and he'll carry back uh, the news of uh, this endowment lecture. And before I invite Mr. Dinesh Bajaj to say a few words, I'd like to mark this occasion as the last meeting in the 14th year of Foswell Hyderabad. Uh, we start, this was founded in 2009 by my father, Mr. Venkateswar Rauti um, He and Mr. M.L. Swami conceived this and formed this. And the good news is we have never missed a single monthly meeting, even during the COVID time. Uh, in the month that the lockdown was imposed, we just conducted that meeting on a different date, subsequent month. So we have had 167 monthly meetings without let, come what may. And we should uh, thank each and every distinguished speaker who gave us their time willingly and shared their knowledge, their experience, our many endowment donors, our logistics sponsor donors, and above all our members you know, we have, uh, I think the average age should be around 75, I don't know, if not more. So it's a, it's been a very enjoyable journey. And um, uh, at this time, it's only apt that we remember our co-founder of Foswell, Mr. ML Swami, who formed the first chapter in Cupertino in California. And I, I'd like to invite Mr. Dinesh Bajaj who is visiting India, but fortunately he is we're very happy he joined us. And it will be apt to have him say a few words to mark this occasion. Dinesh Ji. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations for completing 14 years. And, uh, you know, I join your programs very infrequently. I think I've seen two before. This is probably the third program. But every time I come and also the information you send me, I'm always impressed the high quality of speakers you have and the high level of energy you create in your programs also. So keep doing it. You are pursuing the spirit of Mr. ML Swami the best way possible. So I really feel very good whenever I come here. I feel very proud of this chapter. And I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. ML Swami uh, 1999 to 2000 time frame and I my background is before I talk about him and I'll keep it short uh, I, I'm an engineer from IIT Delhi here came to uh, USA ended up in California and I was an engineer initially but realized I'm a bad engineer so I went into marketing and I realized I'm a bad marketeer I became a salesman and <laughs> And then I had fun. After that, I had fun. And, and that's about the time. And I was actually an engineer turned salesperson, became a very successful salesperson. And then I meet Mr. Swami and I watch him and I watch him and he's better salesman than I ever could be. Here is a person who came from, you know, after retiring from, he was also, I think, superintending engineer and came to America. Engineer. Engineer in chief. He was the first engineer in chief of the state. Yeah. And he comes there and gets involved. And his children pushed him out because he would sit home depressed. And they pushed him out and he started this organization, Foswell. And I remember carrying him carrying a, this, the, you know, salesman bag. And he would go take buses all over, find speakers. And not only find speakers, but find people who should come there every our programs used to be on Monday morning, and on Sunday he would spend all day calling. We lost you, Dinesh Ji. Uh, we are unable to hear you, Dinesh Ji. Today's program is good because you came, and he would tell that to each one, and in a very beautiful way that we all felt very important. So in his memory, I mean, he's an inspiration to me. I 
involved in a couple of uh, programs. And every time I get involved, I, his image comes to my mind and the spirit that he had there is lit up in me in some ways also. Not as good as his, but he was, he is, he was an inspiration. He's still an inspiration and will continue to be an inspiration. So that's all I wanted to say about him. And I see that spirit in your chapter also very much so. So thank you. Thank you for letting me say a few words about it. Thank you, Dinesh Ji. Thank you. I hope you can attend. Uh, if you're still around in the next month, please do attend the next meeting. I, too. I will definitely. Thank you. Well, um, Mr. Shailendra Dasari, you're on the meeting. I can see your name. Uh, Sudhakar was wondering if you are from the Kakedada College. I think uh, he just realized that. Yeah, I am. Andhra Loyola College. Loyola College. Loyola College. Sudhakar. Okay. Is he Dr. Sudhakar? Uh, he is the former chairman MD of ECIL. Oh uh, yeah, we were uh, no classmates at uh, oh, okay. Loyola. Yeah, good, yeah. good, good that you can reconnect. Um, may I now call upon Arti. Uh, Dinesh Ji, she spoke on a topic called pastoralism. Am I right, Arti? The story of the, not nomads, what do you call them? Uh, Semi-nomadic. Semi-nomadic yeah. tribes in the yeah. Kutch area. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She is a student uh, of London School of Economics, and uh, she is Anand, my classmate Anand Halbe's daughter. They live in Pune. So I, I don't think uh, I would have ever thought of a topic like pastoralism and invite such a knowledgeable speaker, but for Anand telling me about her subject. Arti, would you introduce our very distinguished speaker for this evening, Seema? Yes, absolutely. Um, so good evening, everyone, and um, I'm delighted to introduce Seema Bhatt to you all today. Uh, I've known Seema my entire life. Uh, she's probably remembers more of that time than I do. Um, and she's a very, very dear friend and mentor. And um, I actually also chose to study environment and conservation as I got into college and my career has run along similar tracks. And she's always been a very constant source of encouragement and support. So I'm quite familiar with her work, but I'm really excited for you all to hear a bit about it as well today. So let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, over the past 30 plus years, Seema has worked quite extensively on biodiversity, climate change adaptation, and ecotourism, both in India and across Asia. Uh, she's based in Delhi, where she's currently the national biodiversity expert with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, that's FAO. Um, and much of her work on biodiversity has really looked at the intersection of biodiversity conservation and the livelihoods of local people. And one of the areas that really overlaps both conservation and livelihoods is ecotourism. Uh, she's worked, she's explored this area very deeply in the course of her work, and that is going to be the topic that she'll be speaking to us about today uh, in particular. So a bit about her work on ecotourism. She's worked on multiple ecotourism projects across South Asia. She's currently the Honorary Vice President of the Responsible Tourism Society of India and is closely involved in setting standards for ecotourism in India as well. Uh, she has a really impressive set of uh, accomplishments behind her, but just to give you a few highlights, um, she is the South Asia Coordinator for the USAID-supported Biodiversity Conservation Network, where she coordinated two projects on ecotourism. Uh, she was also a Fulbright Research Scholar, which took her to the Center for Responsible Travel in Washington, DC. Um, and at that time, she was looking into the feasibility of ecotourism certification in India. She's also co-authored a book on ecotourism development in India, uh, which was published by the Cambridge University Press. Um, she's worked extensively on climate change adaptation across Asia since 2007, and that's included agencies like DFID, IDRC, and um, USAID. Uh, going further back, she received her master's from the Yale School of Forestry and the Environment. And when she came back to India, she joined WWF India and started work on the Biodiversity Hotspots Conservation Program. So she was also part of the team that pro, uh, produced a final report for India's National Biodiversity Strategy Action Plan, which was for the government of India. Uh, over the past few years, she's also advised the government of Afghanistan on their biodiversity strategy, which is, which to me was always one of the more interesting stories I've heard from her for many travels. Um, so it's pretty difficult to encapsulate kind of the breadth and the scope of her work. Um, but one more thing I'd just like to add is 
I mean, I guess this is kind of fitting for a biodiversity expert, but she's been collecting frog artifacts since 1983. Um, and she owns over 500 of these. We're not talking about realistic frog models. We're looking at how different cultures interpret frogs. Um, and she's been collecting those for many, many years. She's collected them from over 40 countries. Wow. And they were actually the subject of their own entire exhibition at WWF uh, in late 2019, early 2020. Um, so that's a little bit about Seema. Seema, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Arti, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I must tell our audience, uh, one of the reasons, one of the decisions we took in the, the global group of Foswell chapters was to invite young people to all Foswell meetings so that we not only bring down the average age, but we also have a connectivity so that this organization becomes sustainable. That's why we have a young distinguished speaker and we have a younger person introducing her. So Seema, we are all anxious to hear about this topic. I, none of us probably thought of it, you know, tourism, paise aata hai. but responsible tourism. Well, we are all, all years now. You can share your screen and start. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I am really honored to be part of this very distinguished group. And thanks, Arti, for this wonderful introduction. I actually even forgot about some of the things that you talked about. So thanks very much for the reminder. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera and share my screen. And I hope it works. It, it uh, will. There you go. Yeah. Yes, it does. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay. Let me see. I can't see it. So let me just put it down. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, here I am. Um, yeah. I will just put it in the presentation mode. I need to bring this down. Okay. Let me just uh, bring it. Okay. Can everyone see now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, yes, as, as uh, rightfully said, something probably very different from what has been talked about um, in the past in this group. And that is looking at something called ecotourism. And of course, I still use that term, but um, I, I still think that we will talk a little more broad based, but that's part of my story. And I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to take you on the same beaten track that I have been traveling the past many years and introduce you to this, um, this very interesting topic. Um, okay, now I can't seem to, okay. Um, so tourism has actually been one of the two world's fastest growing industries in the pre-COVID years. I mean, I had to actually change the text of this presentation. I make a presentation, I've made this presentation a similar one to a large uh, number of different kind of audiences. And ironically, I had to change some of the text uh, because now we are talking in a post-COVID uh, era. Mm. Uh, so I, was, I would say that tourism has been one of the world's fastest growing industries and has also, played a very important role, dominant role in the economies of uh, developing countries. Um, it has contributed significantly to India's GDP. Uh, this, I actually wanted to put some figures here, but it was a bit depressing and that's why I decided not to put, because this has changed significantly in the post-COVID uh, times. However, one of the things that has come out of this whole uh, post-pandemic time is that the demand for ecotourism, nature-based tourism holidays is expected now to double and even triple in the next 20 years or so. Now, travel, as we all know, is an age-old practice the world over. We have been traveling for uh, centuries and some of the kind of travel we've been doing, pilgrimages. And our pilgrimages have been happening to religious places um, across the globe over centuries. I don't think there's even a track of time. Um, then there is recreation. There is everybody wants to travel uh, for for uh, recreation and um, some of the beautiful places. We, if you look at the right, and as a lot of the places were developed by the British 
as hill stations and many destinations across the country and across the globe where people actually travel because they need a nice holiday. A very recent, relatively recent entrant into the sector of tourism in India is adventure tourism. And there is a huge uptake of this now in the younger generation. And as you know, the youth form a very, very significant part of India's population now. And uh, there is, this is an interesting entrant, which is actually going to make a significant impact of, to tourism in India. There's wildlife tourism. I think all of us have been to some wildlife sanctuary national park in India and particularly to see wildlife. Of course, the big attraction is always a tiger, perhaps now the cheetahs, which have been recently reintroduced. Uh, but this is actually quite a significant, significant part of tourism in the country. What we don't realize actually is there is something called mass tourism. It is tourism that has basically been going on in, in and, and you see it all around you. It's mass tourism. Um, and mass tourism actually, despite, as I started uh, by saying that it tourism has made a significant contribution, it has also led to a lot of conflict. It has led to a lot of conflict with the conservation and the local communities. So let's look at some impacts of tourism. There have been social and cultural change and people living in remote valleys have generally, which have preserved uh, cultural identities have been impacted by the tourism brings with it roads, transportation, communication, and this will change the nature of culture at some point if we are not alert. However, this is not the only reason. I may, before somebody says, look, I think, Honestly speaking, I think cable television and mobile phones have impacted social and cultural, the milieu of this country a lot more. But tourism has had its, its uh, contribution. Now, what we also tend to forget is that tourism is linked to people and, pe and depends on people. But the current model of tourism, which is mass tourism, has really not been able to develop into an economically, socially viable option for local communities. It may have brought revenue to the country. It may have brought revenue to certain sectors, but this kind of tourism that we are talking about has rarely made a significant, uh, has led to significant improvement in the lives of local communities. In fact, a lot of tourism has led to the displacement of people and, uh, and privatization of common resources. And I'll come to this. I'll give you a few examples as we go along. Tourism also brings with it, um, a, there's a very ugly side to tourism, negative side, which is where uh, children are vulnerable to sexual, non-sexual forms of exploitation, child labor, is one of the significant things that has come with mass tourism. There are other problems relating to health, drugs, trafficking of people. And we have heard in the past examples, Goa is a prime example, where all of these negative parts of tourism, the ugly side of tourism has risen its head. There are economic, now this is something I wanted to dwell a little more about as we keep saying that tourism is very good for the economy, but there have been less favorable economic effects of tourism, such as inflation. There's an interesting term that I learned when I was doing research called leakages and, and also dependency. Now, the whole issue about leakages is that, as, and, and the example that is here is that one study estimated that an on average, of every $100 spent on a vacation tour by a tourist from a developed country, only about $5 actually stays in a developing country destination's economy. Now, this is the leakage. This is something we don't realize, but this kind of leakage comes, especially when you have international chain of hotels coming in. Uh, so this is the very uh, uh, kind of tourism that we have all experienced. And what the must, the mass is actually, uh, you know, indulging in. Environmental degradation, I think this is a common sight. As I said earlier, the more you have kind of development, tourism, there are going to be more roads, deforestation. 
is a result of the demand for firewood. There's a lot of other construction of roads. And this, I think, is a common site that we have all seen all over. There is land, water, and noise pollution. And these are, I would again say, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions that are being raised in everybody's mind and saying that, but this doesn't happen in all kinds of tourism. So let me again highlight and say this is, we're talking about unregulated mass tourism, which again is a very common sight in this country. Um, so there is a lot of times when the traffic of tourism has gone beyond what is called the carrying capacity of a destination. This, I think, is a very common sight. Um, it is really a, a very jarring sight, but unfortunately, this is something that you see across the country. Uh, disturbance to wildlife, as I've talked about wildlife tourism, and uh, there have been cases where tourism has led to unsavory um, elements coming in, poaching happening. Although I must also tell you that there is another version of it where they say that tourism has actually helped in curb poaching. Because once you open up an area where people go, the poachers are scared to operate in that area. So this may also be the other side. But I wanted to really take you, I wanted to introduce you to this site, which to me was horrific. And I, I don't know if any of you recognize this, but this is a world heritage site. These are the Galapagos Islands, highly, I mean, highly acclaimed. And I had the good fortune of going there. And this is a site that actually horrified me. These are nesting birds sitting on nests and just see how close the tourists are getting there. I mean, this is really, really something, it's a disturbing site. And you can see the number of tourists on this beautiful, beautiful island, which is only inhabited by these birds. Again, a horrific site. And um, all of us have seen this site, which is the desecration of cultural heritage, architecture. And somehow there is, uh, this is a common sight that we don't want to, but this is something that is pretty rampant. Okay, so now let's come to what I told you. I've, I've, I've basically shared with you some pretty horrific uh, stories. Now, it's not that this was not recognized. The recognition of the ill effects of tourism led to the need to develop an industry that was more sensitive. And therefore the concept of ecotourism came into being. But ironically, actually, this term was coined by a marketing agency that was promoting Costa Rica as a rainforest destination in the early 1970s. So this term has now, it's changed over the years. It started off with being a sort of just a marketing term for Costa Rica, which is a big uh, uh, place uh, for anybody who's interested in nature conservation. But it also uh, you was started being used as a term where uh, it was more sensitive tourism. But let me point out, it's probably one of the most overused and misused word the world over. And in fact, a lot of words coming from ecotourism are being used synonymously. It's sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, nature-based, green travel. And uh, uh, you know, um, there was an interesting study carried out in Vietnam, which showed that 95% of the country's sites being advertised as ecotourism were only sites based on nature, uh, which is not what really ecotourism philosophically means. And I'll come to it in a bit. But what happened ironically was that because ecotourism became a very popular kind of term, every tour operator jumped on that bandwagon and said, we are promoting ecotourism. So what exactly are we talking about? Now, there's a long definition which says responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment and improves the welfare of local people. I would say simply stated ecotourism is environmentally responsible tourism, which is to travel to natural areas where minimal damage uh, is taking place, ecological, social, cultural. There's an element of education. The traveler has to know what he or she is looking at and why it is important to be uh, responsible. Then there are uh, finally 
and which is something that is very often for, uh, forgotten, is that the local community must benefit from this kind of tourism, either financially or in other ways. And when I say other ways, even something simple like a sense of pride, where the local community says, this is our area. Ha, ye hamara area hai. We are proud of it. We are proud of it because tourists come here. So this could also be a benefit. Now, we all are to, talking about sustainable development, the sustainable development goals. And interestingly, ecotourism, it carried out uh, rightly, appropriately, has the potential to conserve the ecosystem, <clears throat> also provide local communities an alternate source of income. And for those of us who are familiar with the sustainable development goals, it's very interesting that if you put tourism, call it eco-tourism or responsible tourism, you can actually find that it links to all of the 17 sustainable development goals. A very interesting exercise that I actually carried out some time. Ecotourism also has a potential to promote rural heritage. Now, when I talk about the sense of pride, it's a very interesting thing because if, uh, if you go into rural communities or if you went Seba <clears throat> 10 years ago, people did not, because the whole idea was to become like the cities. You know, we want to become like the people who live in urban areas. What tourism actually can do is to inculcate in the local people a sense of pride in their culture. If you look around you today, there, are, there is so much tourism that is being promoted because you want to, you want to get a flavor of, the, of, of a rural area or you want to get the flavor of a culture or a heritage of that place. That is a positive of tourism and what tourism can actually do. So you have to remember that tourism can actually promote even local cuisine. I remember going to rural areas where people used to say, Hum kya offer karenge tourists ko? What will we offer tourists? We don't eat the same kind of food. We don't eat bread for breakfast. The idea is to say, don't serve bread for breakfast. So whatever you are eating. You give a local flavor, and that is what is selling today and becoming exceedingly popular. Tourism can be a very important tool for conservation, education, and awareness. How many of us get uh, the chance to go to a wild, a natural area? And it is through tourism, it is through visiting these wonderful areas that still exist in our country and across the world, where we go as tourists, but you get some idea of what this ecosystem is and and what is what are the wonderful uh, elements of this ecosystem and i'm not talking only about what we call the charismatic megafauna I'm not talking about tigers we're not talking about elephants but even the birds or even the smaller mammals is what we really get to see and it really gives you a sense of pride for our natural heritage so the changing face of tourism, and I'm going to tell you a few stories. I'm going to take you uh, crisscrossing across the country that people are doing after realizing the negative impacts of mass tourism and what I call the changing face of tourism. So let me start with first an example of the Kiola Dev Ghana National Park or commonly called the Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary in Rajasthan very interesting story and i consider this probably the pioneer of ecotourism in india it started with a very ugly story whereby when this area was declared a national park the villagers were kind of told overnight that you cannot use the resources from here as you can see this lady trying to get firewood out of this area they were very clearly told you cannot use this area <clears throat> there was a conflict and I'm talking early 70s, and uh, there were eight people who died in a police firing. This was the beginning. But what changed here was a very dynamic forest officer who came as the, as the park director, who decided that let's change this whole idea of conflict and let's train the local communities as bird guides. 
And uh, this is a small, if most of you, many of you might have visited this park, you can't take a car inside. You either take these cycle rickshaws or you walk. It's a 28 square kilometer bird sanctuary. Uh, get a phenomenal number of uh, migratory birds. And you can, or you take these cycle rickshaws. And uh, you, you these, these people are local from the surrounding villages. They were trained in bird watching. And today, if you go there, they are the best bird watchers. They will show you all the birds. They will actually even rattle off their scientific name. And a lot of them actually speak fluent German and French because they're German and French primarily. The tourists who used to visit here were from those two places. And this has made a, a huge difference to the, to the whole uh, interface between the park authorities and the community. It's a win-win situation, and it's it's wonderful to travel with these people. Okay, I'm taking you to Sikkim now. This is actually my first ecotourism project that I worked on in, in the uh, in the mid '90s. Uh, this is the Kanchenzonga National Park. As you know, we all know about the Kanchenzonga, the the mountain range. This is in the buffer zone of the national park, and we actually I, I coordinated a project here. This is a trekking trail, uh, which starts from a small village called Yoksam. Okay. And uh, this was a very, very small village, which was completely neglected. People used to come from Gangtok, not stop at the village, just go up the trekking trail, come back and go back to Gangtok. What we did was we actually changed the whole profile of this village. And we said, why don't some of the interested people start doing homestays? Because you must get the flavor of, the, of this particular area. By the way, this has one of the oldest monasteries in, uh, in Sikkim. And the story goes that the three lamas who came to this, sanct to this monastery actually were the, laid the foundation for the state of Sikkim or then the kingdom of Sikkim. So it's a very significant town. And for those of you who lived through Bollywood in the 1970s, this is also the hometown of Danny Denzongpa. It's a very powerful family, uh, the Denzongpa family. Uh, so we started with this. There was training of uh, tour guides, of porters, of lodge operators. And as a result of this project, what, what emerged was actually a wonderful young group of people from the village that called themselves the Con Kanchenzonga Conservation Committee. They just formed and they actually started cleaning up the trail before the season, after the season. And they are a wonderful group that exists even today. They are actually so empowered that they help other communities write project proposals to get projects. They do a wonderful job of waste segregation. Please look at these tins. It's all different waste. Waste is segregated here. All the waste is collected from the trekking trail, put in these bins that are carried back all the way to Gangtok. Amazing group which still exists and I'm very, very proud of this project. Please do do this. It's a, it's a tough trek to do, but those of you who are adventurous, please go and do this trek. Okay, coming to Ladakh my next favorite place and my next place of work uh, was, uh, again, the wonderful, wonderful, beautiful area of Ladakh, where uh, a conservation, there are two conservation groups. One is the WWF India and the other is the Snow Leopard Conservancy that started work, interestingly, on the Snow Leopard. What happens, and I'll, let me show you the traditional houses. This is a traditional house in what is the Hemis National Park. Now, what, happened, what happens in this area is that during the winter, the snow leopard actually comes down. It's too cold up. And then what it does is that here, the, the livestock is stored in, 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 in these one of these sheds, which, are, as you can see, on the lower side to your left. Um, they, they are, they're all stored here. They're all uh, given shelter here, the livestock of these people. Now, what happens is the snow leopard comes down it is cold, it is hungry. If the snow leopard, and it manages to break into one of these, it kills all the cattle there, all the livestock. Now, this has again created a very hostile situation with the community. 
and they were all set to kill the snow leopard. Until this wonderful organization, the Snow Leopard Conservancy came and said, why don't we start homestays? By the way, this is part of a one, it's the trekking, uh, start of a trekking um, from this place is uh, the uh, Hemis National Park. This is a village where people stop and then go on for their trek. So they started homestays, they trained the local women, and the women started earning. Now this changed the, completely changed the hostile, uh, the hostility of the people. Uh, and they realized that if we save the snow leopard, then people, more people are going to come here to see it. And they, they uh, I have actually stayed in, this is the place where I stayed, this house, wonderful room, clean, comfortable, warm, with the wonderful warm hospitality of the local Ladakhi lady. And you get a great flavor of the culture. So this is the other project, which was done by WWF. And it was in a high altitude lake called Somuriri, where again, it gets a lot of migratory birds. These are the homestays, which as you can see are right at the edge of the lake. So you can stay here, look out of your window and see the beautiful lake and the migratory birds that come here. Okay, taking, down, taking you down to the south, to southern India, to Periyar, to Periyar National Park, a wonderful, wonderful national park, which again has a very interesting story. There used to be a lot of local smugglers here. They were smuggling essentially sandalwood and uh, creating a lot of havoc in this place. Again, one dynamic forest officer came here and decided that why don't I start looking, talking to this community and changing and uh, offering them jobs as tour guides. Now, you, as you know, if you're a poacher, then you know this place inside out. You'll know it like the palm of your hand. So basically, they started talking to the forest department and they're also outcasts, as you know. I mean, one of the most uh, sort of ill-famed person uh, not far from here was Virapan. Um, they are essentially outcasts and they actually started, they got a regular salary from the forest department. They started as brilliant tour guides and they actually got a status in the community. And as you can see here, uh, they also have a uniform. They are being taken, they are taking tourists and they are explaining the entire ecosystem to, um, to the tourists. And this entire thing was a great hit. They also had women's societies here. By the way, Periyar is very close to the very famous temple, Sabri Malai, where thousands of people go every year. Now, this is a group of local women who call themselves the Vasanta Sena. And they took it upon themselves to clean up the area before and after the whole Sabriwala pilgrimage. So they, um, now they have a foundation that was set up after uh, these tour guides uh, and these ladies started to work here and they have uh, actually got a sizable amount of money in the foundation and they decide to use it uh, the best way that they would like to do it. Okay, uh, this is something that Aarti must have talked to you about, but I will probably look at, touch upon a different aspect of this town, called, this village called Hortka in Gujarat, which has one of the best community owned and managed ecotourism places, which is called Shame Sarat. This is the entrance. As you can see, this is called Shame Sarat. The story behind this is again quite interesting. This was one of the sites that was selected under an ecotourism, uh, endogenous tourism project of the Ministry of Tourism and um, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. They had selected about 52 sites across the country to uh, support rural tourism and rural heritage. Um, I mean, what happened to the other sites is a, a, another story, but only two of them actually survived and flourished, and uh, Shami Sarad is one of them. Um, these people had never done tourism before, but they worked. The local collector was quite dynamic, and there was already an NGO Sajivan that was working there. And they got together with these people and they said, okay, do you think we can try and do tourism here? Now, uh, the local community, the panchayat was very reluctant. They had never done tourism here. 
the initial idea was to do homestays, which essentially means that you let out a room in your home where tourists can come and stay. However, this is a fairly traditional Muslim community, and they don't, they did not relish the idea of doing uh, keeping guests in their houses. So they said, okay, let us construct new, uh, they had a they had a panchayat land where they said, okay, let's do it here, which is a little away from the village. Uh, so there is no, uh, you know, there's no, um, uh, there's no discomfort, but let us build these in a traditional structure. So these are bungas, which are the traditional architecture and they are mud structures, which are very well insul insulated. So as you know, we are in the desert, they are cool in the summers and they are very warm in the winter. And they also, um, if you will recall the horrendous earthquake that happened in Gujarat, primarily in Kutch, there were a lot of tents that had been left over. So they did a combination of bungas and tents. And Kutch, as you know, is famous for its embroidery. Um, I will just show you that picture a little later. So the inside is fully furnished with that beautiful embroidery. A training was conducted of local youth. And as you can see, these are all lo local youth. Mind you, tourism here is a part-time thing. It only happens in the winter. The, these youth are there. They are trained as uh, through for local hospitality. And the most wonderful thing here is that they serve only vegetarian food. There is no alcohol. You by and large eat. Of course, they do make an exception. As you can see, there's a toaster here. But other than the toast in the morning, it is local food, local cuisine that is served by these people. Incidentally, they all go back to their own pastoral duties once the tourism season is over. And, um, you know, it's, 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 this, this particular resort is booked like six months in advance by tour groups, primarily out from outside uh, India. I wanted to just show you a, a, a you know a wonderful example of the beautiful embroidery, and uh, this is what is passed on from mother to daughter. Uh, the women, incidentally, because it's a fairly conservative community, are never seen, but their beautiful work is displayed everywhere. Okay, now going back, we are going to Arunachal Pradesh. How much time do I have? About ten minutes more. Sorry, I was just unmuting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have another 15 minutes. Oh, perfect. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, another story, another part of the country. I am intentionally making you crisscross the country so that, you know, we know how amazing our country is um, and not following a, a sort of uh, going off the beaten track as, as, uh, as my title suggests. Um, Arunachal Pradesh, the Eagle's Nest Wildlife Sanctuary uh, another very interesting story. In the 1990s, there was um, an astrophysicist, actually, who was an ardent birder also, who visited this area, almost pristine, untouched. This was, as you can see from, you don't see this kind of forest. Very rarely do you see it now, except in the Northeast. He came to this area and he said, oh my God, this is paradise. This is actually wonderful. And he, he started talking to the local community, which is an indigenous community called the Buguns. And he said to them, will you help me with identifying these plants and uh, you know all uh, the things here? And the Buguns turned around and asked him, so what is in it for us? I mean, what, what do we get from uh, you know, sharing all our knowledge with you? And that's the time that he decided that, okay, I think it's a great place and he started with a group of five birders. It's a birding paradise, this place. It's, it's an amazing place for birds. And he brought five birders here and it was a hit. Uh, and then he started working with the local community and says, why don't you, if you have any spare houses, this is all indigenous, as you can see on the top right hand corner, there are indigenous uh, you know, kind of structures. Would you be interested in hosting these guests here? And also taking them out birding, since you guys have an amazing amount of knowledge. And they also had tents uh, that they were there. Now, this is a group of five birders that came in the uh, 1990s. Today, this place has become one of the top birding destinations in the world. And birders, I may tell you, are um, quite crazy. 
if they decide they want to see one species of bird, they will go across the world. If they if they know that this bird is a, found here, they will grow across the world to see it, just to put a tick mark on their list. And of course, to enjoy the surroundings. And this worked wonderfully. It's worked wonderfully. They also started a, a, a one very interesting thing because the lot of the biodiversity here is still not, was not documented. So they started with a with an interesting program called Vacations for Conservation, where young people from across the country or the world could come. They were given free boarding and lodging, and but they had to document the biodiversity. That was the deal. And so as you can see, you're seeing a very happy group of people here who, who are loving it. And they are in turn documenting the biodiversity of this place. A feather, and, and I'm saying this with a you know, tongue in cheek, a feather in the cap of this whole in, entire initiative came when a new species of bird was discovered here. Entirely new species. And uh, the scientists who discovered it decided to name, in after, name it after the local community. The locals are the Buguns, and this bird is called Bugun Leocicla. And it has made the local community so proud, so very proud, that this is now become an amazing place. As I said, it's one of the top birding destinations of the country. However, um, I, I've, I've told you some of, I've, I've basically pulled out some of the examples. There are many more. But there are many more that have also failed. Uh, let's look at the negative side also. But these are examples that have been close to my heart. And I have worked very closely with some of these initiatives. So that's why I was keen to share them with you. The challenges in growing numbers. If, uh, uh, if uh, any of you have been to Ladakh in the last few years, it has been inundated with tourists. And it's a very fragile ecosystem. It cannot take this number of people. And so the more people you get there, you have to put a cap somewhere, what we call carrying capacity. It is a very, very, it's a very difficult decision because, you know, tourism brings revenue. Uh, so even the locals themselves are in two minds. If, you know, we've had several ecotourism meetings here and they say, and on one hand, they say, oh, you know, you walk in, uh, in lay market in the summer and you will see only outsiders. On the other hand, they are all flourishing because of tourism. You know, shops have increased, tourism has increased, tour guides, taxis, hotels, everything. So where do you put a cap is a challenge. It's a question mark. There are aspirations that are changing. Again, I'd give you an example of from Ladakh. They used to have something called Ladakhi toilet, which was actually a very eco-friendly toilet. It was actually just a hole in, in the ground, but it was on the first floor. And all the droppings used to go into the ground floor and were used later as manure. And it was a dry toilet. You can see uh, on your right hand side, traditional dry composting toilet. You know, it is a because Ladakh is a water scarce area. But what is happening is the demand from tourists is they want Western style flush toilets. And that is where we are now beginning to lose the battle because. And, and also, I mean, I, I would actually like to put this challenge to this group because you have so many esteemed uh, engineers, innovators here, is that why can't we look at innovations, not have a flush toilet, let's have a Western style toilet, but let's have a dry toilet, something like we do on airplanes. And this is where I think some amount of thinking really, really needs to go in. Uh, that's just a thought that I wanted to leave here. Um, what, what makes tourism or ecotourism uh, succeed? Um, I actually want to now go and say that we have to talk about not only ecotourism, but responsible tourism. Every kind of tourism, whether it's a five-star hotel or a homestay, has to be responsible. Um, it does not happen without a lot of effort. The first thing we need to look into is training and capacity building. Everybody talks about nowadays, everybody's talking about rural tourism, community-based tourism, homestays. Overnight, it's not going to happen overnight. There is a huge amount of element of capacity building in hospitality, sanitation, in other kinds of things that is required. Basic things, you know, uh, which 
which you will find maybe in a, in a very high end five star hotel but we need to have the same kind of training even for communities and for homestays you know especially in the post covid era where by the way a lot of domestic tourism is on the rise people want to go to uh, places which are different which are off the beaten track and this is where we really need to focus on the capacity building particularly hygiene sanitation education and awareness as i mentioned earlier this is a beautiful poster by the way uh, that was made by wwf many years ago looking at environmental guidelines education and awareness you need to know what you are what kind of place you are in there has to be some kind of interpretation telling you this is the place this is its usp it you know this is what is found here it's so important i went to the andamans about 10 years ago andamans is one of the i mean it's like a a a complete paradise of natural heritage i didn't see a single poster or board telling me anything about it and this is something that we are really missing out on when you do tourism you also need to have feedback from tourists very important because only then will you improve what we call adaptive management a uh, simple example i had a long i did a lot of work in ladakh with the community based homestays i actually tried to do a certification system and i i interacted with the ladies who run these homestays and i said what is your biggest problem and they said plastic bottles if you read the feedback from travelers they will say the same thing plastic bottles and you uh, i know the himalayan system is fragile things are going to degrade very very slowly there and 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 uh, the women actually gave me a solution and said why don't you have a centralized water purification system and this is again where all your csr and everything can come in can can we can we have centralized water uh, purification system so and make sure that we restrict the number of or even ban the carrying of plastic bottles that's 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 an again a thought i would like to leave back setting of standards and a code of conduct very important uh you know itc has the lead platinum uh, uh rating now we will have to have some kind of rating even for every category of hotels or homestays why should homestays not have a standard i don't talk about i don't say certification because certification becomes a scary word so let's talk simply about setting standards basic things cleanliness hygiene electricity waste guard, disposal etc you have to set standards and there has to be a code of conduct how do you conduct yourself a code of conduct is applicable not only for the tourist but for the host community also very important has to be there carrying capacity i've talked about quite a bit we need to put a cap on numbers we have to unless we want to lose a destination and finally marketing in today's day of of uh, social media marketing is so important and so much easier but it is uh, uh, i i think we all come from the era when we must have watched a film called the field of dreams with kevin costner and it said build it and they will come that does not work with tourism you can build it but they will not come unless you market it so if done well ecotourism can help conserve ecosystems it can bring a smile to communities also but a big caveat it has to be kept in mind that tourism is an unpredictable initiative learned big lesson learned during covid the tourism industry took the biggest beating there are political upheavals take the example of nepal nepal has never still not been able to recover nepal's economy depended entirely on tourism and it took such a beating first because of political upheavals and then because of the earthquake so tourism should be presented to local communities as one option in a basket of livelihood opportunities not the the be all and end all of their livelihoods in the interestingly this is a slide that i added recently that in the aftermath of the covid it has actually brought very interesting opportunities for tourism there is an increase in domestic tourism and people have been so sick and tired of being cooped in they want to get out they want to experience different things new destinations unexplored destinations they want a demand for new experiences 
a greater awareness, but this brings with it a greater responsibility, a greater awareness about hygiene, sanitation. So the whole issue about setting standards becomes even more important. But this is something that uh, the domestic tourism can cash on and give a lot of new experiences, a lot of unexplored destinations. And finally, the challenge is to nurture and not destroy. Thank you so much. I'm going to end here and look forward to questions. Thank you, Seema. It was a, a seamless presentation from Seema, I should say, very nicely. You know, you weaved us from one story to another so effortlessly and all over the country. And uh, I'm sure many of us have not visited uh, some of those or many of those uh, sanctuaries. Uh, before we go on to the questions, I want to leave you with one request or a thought. If you know a good bird watcher, ornithologist, whatever you call them, uh, I had actually scheduled a talk, but that was just before the COVID and we couldn't go through with that. We are uh, interested in adding that subject to our reporter of uh, topics. So since you are connected with these people, if you know a good bird watcher, uh, do recommend the name to me or Anand, and we'd like to invite him or her to speak at one of our meetings. I will be very happy to. He's a naturalist. He's a wonderful speaker, and he's a very dear friend. And so I will put you in touch with him. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> So we have some questions. So let me just start off by posing one question for your comment. You spoke about the many areas in India as examples uh, of conflict that arose because of mass tourism. Could you speak a little about how this problem exists and how was it handled in other countries? other geographies of the world. I mean, Europe is a very popular tourist destination. US, uh, I don't know, not from a historical perspective, but then there's all there a lot of national parks and all, but they're all man-made, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But Africa, and we had a wonderful talk by Anand on um, the various parks in Africa. Could you comment on how those places are, were impacted and how they dealt with it or are dealing with it? Or does this negative impact hold good for those geographies also? Um, in fact, I, I, one, one term that I wanted to introduce you, the negative impacts hold for different countries. You may have read about a lot of beaches uh, or even Venice, for example. They, Venice was actually so overrun with tourists before COVID that they didn't want any more tourists. Uh, there were certain beaches in Europe that basically banned tourists and they gave, by the way, rise to a new term. There is a new term now, to, now that is acceptable in, in tourism and which is called over tourism. Mm -hmm. So this is not a phenomenon that is only restricted to India. It has happened in many destinations and see, it's a hard call that countries or destinations have to take and say that you are, if you care about the ecology of the place, then you will probably have to shut the place down for a certain amount of time. But the important thing is to curb numbers. You, uh, this is a term that keeps coming. It's a term actually that has come from biology, which is carrying capacity. You know, every ecosystem has only this much capacity to withhold these many creatures, you know. Mm -hmm. Now you use this term, now we use it for, eco for tourism also. Take Ladakh, for example, you know, it is a very ecologically fragile area. And if you don't restrict numbers, then you're going to lose. I, I have seen Ladakh, I've been, I, I, my first trip to Ladakh was in 1988. And I have seen, uh, and, and you have seen the, you know, if you remember, there was a, very bad um, a landslide that happened or like uh, uh, it, it, it was, we don't even know what it was that swept off half of Lay's market. 
Now, they actually, because Ladakhis, at least, uh, I believe that, you know, I believe uh, they're Buddhists, they have said it is because of the ill, you know, because of too much greed that this has happened, which is true because you have actually built, number one, you're building concrete structures in a place that is not amenable. Yeah. So that's only one example, but see the way of dealing with it is, is, is seven, I, I think you need to be innovative. You also need to also look at diversification. So you actually diversify your destination and offer different kinds of packages. You know, if you are very a hiker, you go here. If you want to enjoy nature, you go here. You diversify. But it requires a lot of planning and a lot of support from the administration. You know, that's, that's the, I, I'm not, but there are different ways people have handled it. Yeah, just as a follow on, um, another example that comes to my mind is Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore, as you know, is also a very popular tourist destination. And uh, they have this several very popular uh, rainforest kind of a, but all man-made, right? I mean, they have uh, different shows there. How has the impact been in those places? I mean, they seem to be they have found the perfect blend. All the creature comforts for the tourists are excellent. Connectivity is good. Cleanliness is very good in those places. Um, what are your thoughts on how the Singapore uh, Singaporeans have managed it? Singapore is an example. It's all it's all man-made. Yeah. So it's all man-made, and and they have the resources. Let's put it that way. They have the resources. So you can control, you can, you know, they have night safaris, then, you know, you control numbers, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a man-made situation that you can control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look at our, you, you can, you see the, when I talk mass tourism, I'm talking to, you can go to Haridwar or, you know, where people are thronging. But we have managed over the years. I'm, I believe, I mean, I'm taking a completely different example, but I believe the Kumbh Mela is now very well managed. I'm told. You, I'm you just there. took the words out of my mouth. I was about to ask you about Kumbh Mela. I'm told. I have not been there, uh, but I am told that uh, they have managed it well. It's not that we are not, we are trying our best, but we, it's a matter of numbers and scale, you know. Uh, uh, and, and and the U.S., by the way, have, has some fantastic natural heritage, which is natural. But the scale is humongous. You right. know, the scale is humongous. The number of people is much small com smaller compared to the area. I, I remember one example. There's a place called Jamestown. I think Anand may remember this in uh, somewhere in California. I do not know the exact location. They preserved that whole small little quaint town exactly as it was during the gold rush. Yeah. But, you know, including the signboards, the streets, the furniture, what have you. But it has not really grown like other cities. Like if you saw Oakland like 20 years ago, yeah. what it was, what it is, or oh, Fremont, they were all small towns, you know, not very industrialized. But in the last 20 years, they have significantly grown their GDP has grown, their um, industry has grown. So is there a kind of a dichotomy here? If you want the folks in Jamestown to thrive and grow economically, will they have to compromise or sacrifice something? I, I really can't answer that question because I don't know how Jamestown is, is surviving. So I really can't answer that question. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, uh, it's all these places that survive on tourism, you know, it's also, remember, it's seasonal, at least in India. Right. You right. know, so you make your money while the season is on, and then you don't for the rest of it. There has to, it has to be regular, there has to be management, and it has to be regularized. Uh, I mean, the massive, the massive avalanche, the whole Uttarakhand disaster that happened. Mm -hmm. you know, Essentially, because of bad planning, because of irregular, illegal tourist construction on places where it should not have been, which was all washed away. Right. It was very, very bad. 
planning and management? Well, coming to that, I'd like to ask, uh, take us to another different uh, phenomena, which you alluded to in your very first slide, I think, or the second, pilgrimage. You know, you have the Tirupati temple here or the Shirdi Sai Baba in Maharashtra or um, Varanasi, where it's again, uh, well, you can say it's regulated, but it's uncontrolled, right? I mean, per day, there are days when there is there are 100,000 people at Tirupati temple, I'm told. Yeah. So how do you... But it done, you know, I've seen Tirupati, Tirumala as a kid, and I've seen it in um, much later, 20, 30 years later. The place has developed, the people have prospered. What I do not know is the impact it had on the environment and the nature around that. So did you have any thoughts on this religious, you know, places which also have mass tourism in India, especially? Yeah, I, I mean, again, I'd say regulation. It's the only, and one person can make a difference. One, one enlightened uh, DC can make a difference. I mean, I've, I've told you examples of uh, national parks where one forest officer actually mm -hmm. has changed the profile of that area. So there is, where there's a will, there's a way. And there has to be innovation. Um, I mean, there are implications. I, I'll come back to Ladakh because I, I've, I've known that area. Uh, Ladakh being declared a union territory is going to have huge implications. And they could be good or bad. So administration plays a big role. So it's more, uh, you know, policy, public policy that should drive, you know, in framing the standards, like you said, or instead of certification or guidelines Absolutely. or a framework. I mean, every, every state has a state tourism policy. Right. Now they're even beginning to develop state ecotourism policies. Mm -hmm. So they have to be followed. Uh, Sikkim, by the way, Gangtok now has one one street, entire street, which is only it is vehicle free. Right. Because they have in, they have enforced that, and it's a lovely place to walk around, you know. But it they have made sure that it's vehicle free. Right. Yeah. We have a question about the Statue of Unity. You know the recently installed one in Gujarat. And we recently had another one here. It looks like there's a competition on who will install the tallest uh, statue in the country. Um, the statue of Ramanuja, which was inaugurated by the prime minister, I think a few months ago. And then somebody else is building a huge Shiva statue somewhere else. These are again man-made, but these are in smaller villages, you know, nearby the town. So the question is, um, are these desirable from an environmental perspective or, um, you know, are they detrimental to the concept of ecotourism in the first place? I don't think they even, I don't think they even fall in the category of ecotourism. They are just, they are just tourist destinations, mm -hmm. many tourist destinations and I mean, they're not, uh, they don't fall into ecotourism. So they will be, I mean, you know, uh, people like to go and see these places. So they will come up. Most of them come up in, you know, semi-urban areas. So it's not like, I don't know about the others, but you're not destroying so much of, uh, you know. And see any tourist destination, if there is a good interpretation, mm -hmm. if there's good signage, there's good text, there's something to learn. So, you know, as, as, you, as I said, people want to go for recreation. And I believe, I have not been there, but Statue of Liberty has become a big recreation spot, you know. So, uh, it, it, it depends. I, I really haven't gone there, so I can't comment on whether they have good signages and interpretation. But Yeah, from know. pictures, it appears that the Statue of Unity has... Is well managed. It appears. I haven't been either, but it yeah, appears. Yeah, because it's... now they are having a lot of, uh, you know, conventions, conferences, international, national. Right. And I, I'm sure with the G20, there's going to be a lot more footfall there also. Right. You know? mm. So I, I it, it's a tourism, it's a new tourist destination, basically. Yeah. Anand was wondering, you know, you mentioned about Hotka as one of the success stories under the UNDP program that you did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
why only just two locations actually worked out of the two examples you gave? And uh, was there some specific reasons for the high failure rate on this project? Yeah, I think the failure rates were many because, see, you need a, a, you need a team and you need, a, a, you need dynamic leadership to begin with. A lot of factors come into being. At that point, when uh, Shami Sarat was started, there was a very dynamic district collector. You also, you know, it's a combination of things. There was already an uh, NGO working there, Sajivan. And so there was a rapport with the local community. You can't come like in from an outsider and say, I want to, you know, establish a rural tourism. Uh, you need to have a, a rapport with the community. You need to sit down. They, they had a rapport. They sat down with the panchayat. They heard them through. As I said, very significantly, the, the, the local community said, we don't want homestays. So they said, okay, let's look at an alternate model. So it's a long-term process, you know? And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, inputs that went into it. There were a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of discussion. There was a lot of participation that happened. There was a buy-in from the community. Number one, no project will succeed unless there's a buy-in from all stakeholders. Most of these projects failed because you can pour in money pour in money, build something and, you know, it will fail after that whole thing is over. You know, it's all right. project based. To keep it sustained and that is why I, I like to use the example of Shame Sarad because eventually it has become community owned and managed. They could hand it over to the community. You know, which is not a usual case. So it's a combination of factors that right. happen. So I'd like to ask uh, one question uh, before I uh, post something very different. You know, in many policy regions, we talk about the three E's, you know, the education, engineering, and enforcement. So are there, is there an effort on the part of the government of India, we are speaking about India now, to actually develop some course curriculum to train people in tourism, not in hospitality. I know there are a lot of catering and f &B kind of colleges. Uh, I think I've heard of just one or two for tourism. Are there educational initiatives to also prepare people and equip them like this uh, district collector or somebody you mentioned just now? Is there an education program which is also in the offing in addition to developing standards? I, there is, and I I'm, I can't about on the off the top of my head, uh, but there are a few uh, institutions that do train people in tourism, and 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 Ministry of Tourism is also um, trying its best. You know, see, they want to market India as incredible India. You know, right. and so there are destinations, especially incidentally, I I I do keep mentioning G20 because I have been pulled into it now big time. But G20 is, I mean, tourism is going to be, because they want to market India as a big destination. Mm -hmm. so it, to, the Ministry of Tourism is going to play a significant role here and hopefully for the best. But uh, there are, um, you know, the Responsible Tourism Society is, was actually a brainchild of the Ministry of Tourism. And um, they do fall back on agencies to, you know, nav help them navigate through this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, and there are institutions, but I won't be able to name, uh, but I can I can get back to you on those. Yeah, I mean, it's just a question of capacity building, right? I mean, there are, you know, advocates like you, Seema Bhatt or the DM of that particular, but this is individual passion that is uh, driving, uh, you know, your work. But unless we have capacity built yeah. into the country's system, the, the whole policy making system and... Uh, I think Mr. Gopalakrishna joined us a little late, but I'm sure he will be able to relate to this and maybe comment. He is the former chief secretary of Ramah State. Mm -hmm. uh, public policy should also envisage capacity building in any initiative. So that's the context in which I asked this question. I know there are some Dehradun uh, Indian Institute of Forestry and all, but they are more related to the forest cover and all and not the ec economic uh, sustainability aspects that you have brought in and the uh, local community protection. That brings me to a complete, a slightly different one. 
uh, different uh, thought. In the US, while they have some large natural preservations, there is also a large criticism as a, a whole school of thought is there about the way the US government over the years has destroyed the, the Native American culture. Yeah. You know, their settlements, there are some laws which protect, you know, Nevada is a big example how they were allowed to give the yeah. you know, gaming casinos and all that. Do you have an insight into that or, you know, their policy, what went right, what went wrong? Well, yeah, I mean, in fact, um, we use that example often that, you know, if you uh, Yellowstone National Park, I mean, Yellowstone National Park in the history of protected areas of the world is probably one of the first, but it was at the cost of the indigenous people. Hmm. And they had a, actually an agreement. The indigenous people had an agreement saying that they will be allowed the use of that area, which was, which was they later on, uh, they said, no, we, we're not going to adhere to the agreement. So yes, it was at the cost of many indigenous communities. And uh, there's a similar parallel in Australia, the Aborigines? Aborigines actually have much more. They have many more. They're much stronger in their uh, rights. Compared to the U.S.? Yes, yes. So they are slightly better, I would say. Yes. And we see the conflict with the tribals in our own countries in some areas. And recently, one forest officer was killed um, due to an arrow injury because they went to prevent these people. In like one of the slides, you showed the lady trying to collect firewood. Yeah. So this guy was, or well, the tribal guy was trying to get into the forest. The forest officer prevented him and they shot arrows at him and he was killed. Right here in Telangana, somewhere in Telangana. Uh, Gopal Krishnagar, I don't know if you heard my question. Would you like to comment? Okay, maybe he's not. A... So that I think brings us to an end to our interaction session. Thank you so much. And may I now call upon our secretary, Mr. Subhash Chandra Bose, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. President of Hospital Hyderabad, Sri Venkateswaragaru, distinguished speaker, Ms. Seema Bhatt, family and friends of late Kokala Nagendra Ravagaru, Australians and invitees. Thank you all for joining our 168th monthly meeting. This meeting marks the completion of 14 years of Fosfell Hyderabad chapter without a break. We wish to thank each one of the distinguished speakers, patrons, endowment donors, logistic donors, and most importantly, our members who made this journey possible and so very enjoyable. At this moment, we also remember and pay tribute to late ML Swami Garu, the prime mover in setting up Coswell for his vision and foresight. We thank the family members of late Pokal Nagendra Rao for establishing an annual endowment lecture in the month of December in his name. We also thank Sri Shiv Sharma Duguri Garu for the logistic sponsorship for the month of December every year in the name of his grandson, Master Valmik Vishnu Vartipalli. Thank you, Mrs. Indira Narayana, for reading the prayer. Thank you, Ms. Arati Halbe, for joining us from Pune and for introducing the distinguished speaker. Frankly, I'm sure most of us associate tourism with the economic advantages it brings to the region where tourists visit and many other advantages of development that it brings. I, for one, never thought of the environmental and social consequences of tourism. 
Ms. Seema's excellent presentation opened our eyes to the need for a more comprehensive assessment of tourism and the impact on not just nature and biodiversity, but also the livelihoods of the local communities. Thank you very much, Ms. Seema. Thank you so much. I hope um, I hope it was an interesting lecture. I enjoyed myself. So. <laughs> no, very interesting. <laughs> okay. I think he's just I cross, 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 scrolling on the screen. I think. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, oh, ah, just in. We truly appreciate your educating us all on this important aspect of tourism. We also sincerely thank Mr. Anand Halbe for introducing such an eminent speaker to us. In 2023, we will feature the following very eminent speakers and a wide range of interesting subjects. On 21st January 2023, Mr. Ram D. C. Ram. Chief of the Software and Systems Division in the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, Information Technology Laboratory, Government of USA, will speak on transforming healthcare through digital revolution. In February 2023, Mr. Vijay Balakrishnan, a retired tech executive from the US, will speak on his book, The Swaraj Spike. In March 2023, <coughs> Dr. Vikas Sukhatme, Dean, Emory School of Medicine, Chief Academic Officer and Emory Healthcare, Woodruff Professor, Emory School of Medicine, will speak on his pioneering work on new frontiers in cancer cure. In April 2023, Dr. Uh, Mr. Sharma APVN, former Secretary, Ministry of Shipping and Ports, Government of India, will speak on development of the shipping and ports infrastructure in India in recent years. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Till we meet on the third Saturday, 21st January 2023, for our 169th monthly meeting. Stay safe and wish you all a very happy. New Year and Happy Sankranti and Pongal. Thank you all. Thank you, Andy. Seema, so I'll uh, connect with you to get the name of the bird watcher professional. I will. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much again. It was a delight to hear you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Good night, everybody. I'll now close the call. Yeah. Good night. Good night, Andy.